The Alan Watts Radio Library was recently struck by lightning. While none of the original recordings were damaged, several apparently new Alan Watts lectures appeared spontaneously in electronic format alongside the original lessons. We now present these new recordings of philosopher and teacher Alan Watts that materialized 45 years after his death in the only way we know how to present them, broadcasting these lectures on Pacifica Radio at random time slots between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m., when you happen to be the most stoned. For more on Alan Watts, find an open-air market and follow the scent of patchouli. When we really look at love, and we look at companionship, what we find is that love is desired. Generally, those who fall in love, they enjoy it. (laughs) That's why we seek love. It reminds us of the gratifying aspects of being alive. It reminds us that our lives are enriched when brought together with another. And so the absence of love feels like loss. As shadow feels like the absence of light, and you feel cold when the heat no longer warms you. And some fall into the trap that is encouraged by some thinkers in the church, by some contemporary philosophers, by some thinkers on the internet that to be without love is a fate worse than death. (laughs) And you see them. You see them online posting terrible, self-effacing statements. I'm an incel, you know. I'm not getting laid, so it's everybody else's fault. What you need to understand, what one must understand is that there are billions of people all striving for gratification, for pleasure, for love. What you are is an aspect of the infinite God, a God who has decided to sometimes live as someone who enjoys great romance, great love, uh, the the Casanova of life, having affairs. Sometimes God chooses to enter the world and and start a family and be committed. And you can enjoy these things in the same life. God does that as well. But sometimes God enters the universe and becomes a tree. (laughs) And a tree loves in a way that uh, would be very foreign to most humans. A tree can't see. A tree can feel. But a tree can play. When a tree loves, it it releases its love into the air. (laughs) <laughs> it's at the mercy of the insects, you see. And sometimes God enters the universe as an incel. Because God must experience great triumph and great defeat. The lesson that really must be taught, the lesson of the game, that God or, you know, the Buddha, or whoever you want to say, is teaching himself is that ultimate compassion is the only lesson there is. If you're celibate, you might as well enjoy it. You might as well jump in and say, well, this is where we are. This is the game. I'm a hopeless loser. Might as well enjoy it. Whee! You see? There's no point in telling yourself, oh, I'm trapped. I don't want to be this way. You are this way. Walk the path that you walk and enjoy it. The path could change, but the path may not. Nobody wants to fuck an incel because they're they're ungroovy, you see. They're just not, they're they're not with it. (laughs) It's the self-fulfilling path. I cannot love, therefore I cannot love. 
But if you embrace it and say, I do not love because I do not want to, then who knows? <laughs> the path may take unintended turns. In other words, if an incel wasn't such an incel, <laughs> they wouldn't feel the need to be involuntarily celibate. <laughs> and that's sort of joie de vivre. That's what attracts people to you. <laughs> but don't take my advice. I, uh, I'm a liar. I'm a cad. While I'm speaking, I'm, I'm scrawling, you see. <laughs> and those of you in the room, of course, you can see these are Zen characters. Characters from the Upanishads. They are cuneiform scrawlings. They are the ancient texts. And I just sort of draw them because the, some, some people doodle on the margins of their papers uh, symmetrical objects while you're on hold with the phone company. When I doodle, it has the great significance of a Zen master. <laughs> Which, when we really get down to it, is utterly pointless. And that is the point. The greatest, most serious point of our existence is that it means nothing. <laughs> it's all a game, you see. The reality that you know is the reality that you have been conditioned to understand as real. But when you take a look at it, when you really look at it, when you put your glasses on or when you take them off or when you squint your eyes, you know, in a spiritual sense, what comes into focus is that nothing you know is real. You might say, well, that's not true. I, I put my hand on the stove and it burns. Why, yes. But the sensation is not there because you aren't there. If you're burning yourself on a stove... There's merely billions of molecules that have decided or been forced to hurt themselves. <laughs> so you might as well barbecue it. Roast your hand on the stove. It's not real. You might as well cook your hand. If you don't like eating meat, you can throw it to a dog. The dog is not real either. But if you're going to burn your hand, you might as well not beat yourself up about it. Say, I'm burning my hand. <laughs> Everything dies. All things die. Death is part of life, you understand. I'm now drawing the character of infinity, which is the same character as nothing, only doubled over. You are not real. The irony, of course, is that to have the authority to say such a thing, you must violate that central principle. Well, here I am saying this to you. <laughs> I'm not real either. That's why listening to me is a waste of time. I am essentially a backyard fraud from the late 1960s. And early 1970s, sent to soothe the pain of people whose brains are too big. That's why they play me on KPFK. That's why you hear me at three in the morning on the radio, when you're too stoned, crying, leaving a party, because you didn't get what you want. And then you hear this, and you go, oh. <laughs> what could that be? It is nothing but the echo of eternal nothingness. But since it's rippling through you in a familiar pattern that you know to your mind and your ear, since the voice sounds like Tony the Tiger is trying to seduce you, you come to think of it as some sort of great cigarette-smoking, enlightened fool in the mountains. And that's exactly what I am. <laughs> Constantly drunk. High on tobacco at every moment. Psilocybin mushrooms coursing through my veins. I smell of lysergic acid. And yet, somehow I've passed myself off as the voice of wisdom itself. This is nothing but a, a pure hat trick. I've fooled you all. I am a fraud. <laughs> and I am God revealed at the same time.